thank you to Vandergraaff for sponsoring this month's edition of Road to Recovery. Visit their website for more information about the Vandergraaff drum motor designed specifically for heavy industry applications. Obviously, we're going to talk about MSHA a lot, but uh, we're here in July. I feel like it's been four months since MSHA probably started to make adjustments, but it seems like like uh, from what I hear and what I read in your column from month to month and what I hear in the industry that, that uh, MSHA wasn't necessarily the, the quickest to react or what hasn't really been a smooth transition. So I'm wondering if you can kind of lay out what, what was MSHA's transition into this new normal like and, and uh, what kind of hiccups have there been if you're a producer or, or just kind of looking at MSHA for leadership on certain things? Yeah, thank, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. And thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Um, you know, MSHA's response to what, the challenges we were all facing with the COVID virus really was was surprisingly slow. Um, OSHA and certainly the CDC was out in front of everything, but OSHA was pretty quick to start issuing um, some very detailed guidance and, and to revising that, which they continue to do, I think in a very um, thoughtful way. You know, we may not agree with everything they do, but but OSHA really has taken a deep dive into different workplaces and what may be required and what might fit for um, to protect their populations. Whereas MSHA really has been, at least from what we can see from the outside looking in, much more reluctant to take that type of an approach. And instead has really issued very piecemeal um, insights and guidance, if you will, into where they see um, exposure risk, you know, in particular the mining industry, and, um, and, and more importantly, what they feel that we need to do to protect, um, to protect miners. And then I think, you know, the third really critical piece of that that we've been wanting to hear more about from the agency has been what they're going to do in terms of enforcement. And that also has been very, very um, sparse in terms of what they've been putting out. Um, more recently, within the last um, month or so, MSHA has been putting some guidance on their website. But, it, but again, it's just been very, very little in terms of how they're going to enforce their standards. And in particular, for example, they've posted on their information that for their, their training requirements, they are willing to work with operators and being flexible in terms of um, meeting those deadlines that appear in MSHA standards that you know, nobody can meet right now with the uh, social distancing requirements. And, and uh, challenges of returning people you know, to the workplace in full force and that sort of thing. Um, but MSHA really hasn't put out a lot of other information in writing in terms of how flexible they're willing to be. And instead, they've been telling mine operators to contact the districts um, where they're located, which you know, to me is sort of their pros and cons to that. Um, the, the advantage to that is it means that um, maybe MSHA is signaling that they're willing to tailor what they're going to do for um, you know, re reviewing your compliance in terms of what's practical and what's needed at your mine site for exposure protection, as opposed to um, just you know, pure mine safety. Um, so the flexibility is that that's a positive thing. We don't really get that if things are written in stone. Um, but you know, on the other hand, it does leave mine, um, mine operators guessing as to what's going to be required. And it really doesn't give them fair notice from an enforcement perspective when MSHA does come out and issue citations. I mean, you know, I, I think one of the things I, I would advise to mine operators to deal with this is, um, you know, if you have questions, do ask your district office, um, see what they're willing to do for you in terms of adjusting their enforcement requirements. Um, but also really stay tuned to what MSHA is putting out there. Um, while you won't see much on their website, um, they are doing stakeholder calls quarterly, which they've always done. But I think now those calls are a little more substantive than they used to be. Um, they just did one um, at, um, end of June, early July, where um, they actually took a lot of questions from the, um, the participants on the call um, that went into very, very um, great detail on uh, COVID compliance um, challenges. Like for example, they talked about uh, being flexible on fit testing for respiratory protection, which is something that's hard for operators to do when you want to maintain social distance and have people you know, wearing their masks. Um, they, they also talked about being more flexible on uh, meeting the first aid certification requirements in MSHA standards um, and other things that are sort of quasi-training requirements that MSHA has. 
So, you know, if you can stay tuned to those things and, and, and listen when, when MSHA is putting out information, even if it's not posted on their website, it's another great um, resource. But, but all in all, um, you know, it has been difficult um, in terms of how slow MSHA has been in putting out any detailed guidance. And, and this really has kind of opened the door for um, uh, outside influences, if you will, to try to change what MSHA is doing. So, you know, for example, we've seen the, um, the bill that Senator Man Manchin has put in on the Hill um, to require MSHA to do an emergency temporary standard and, and some other things that are COVID related and even maybe broader than that, looking at infectious disease in general. Um, and, and that bill, by the way, is just sort of stalled right now. Um, and then also the, um, the case filed in the DC circuit by the unions, which MSHA just recently won, um, where they also were trying to uh, require MSHA to put out an emergency temporary standard. So, you know, the fact that MSHA sort of left this, this void does um, make them um, vulnerable, if you will, to others trying to influence what they're gonna do. Um, you know, I would hope as we move forward that we won't need this guidance from MSHA as much as we have over the last few months, but um, it looks like, you know, we're, we're in to dealing with the virus for a while. So it would be helpful if MSHA became a little more forthcoming um, on this type of information. So slow transition, some flexibility is built in, built in to help mining companies, but um, I'm curious, I know you're talking to clients, your bill is to, what, what sort of feedback are you getting regularly about the experience with, with MSHA on the front lines. I can imagine there's, there's probably some issues or complaints that are coming up with inspections. Um, what's the typical interaction been like, Margot, the last few months? I think um, I'll kind of start with where we are now. I think overall things have gotten better than, pardon me, where they started. Um, initially, there were, um, again, I, I think a lot of, um, kind of piecemeal guidance going out to inspectors, going out to the field offices. And uh, consequently, you, you were just sort of all over the place in terms of you know, what an inspector might or might not do when he comes onto your property. It was very hard to predict how they were going to behave and, and whether they were really taking this threat seriously or not. So we were hearing stories from you know, clients, um, you know, quite concerning stories about inspectors just taking absolutely no precautions whatsoever and uh, refusing to you know, comply with what we wanted them to do, which was very reasonable in terms of not gathering minors together and doing the social distancing. But, but you know, looking at where we are today, I'd say we, we really aren't seeing that as much as we were by any means. I mean, I think it's, it has improved quite a bit. But MSHA still, I think, feels that they can't require inspectors just to do certain things. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we do still see some variance in terms of, of um, how careful you know, the way we might judge it, um, inspectors are being in terms of um, protecting the people they come in contact with from exposure and protecting themselves as well. Um, so there, there certainly are some things that, that could get better um, in terms of what we see inspectors doing on mine property. Um, you know, one of the things we do suggest again is, is to contact your local MSHA office if you feel that inspector really is, is not taking precautions seriously. Um, and ask that, that the inspector supervisor to, uh, to intervene and do something about it. Um, mine operators, unfortunately, can't require an inspector to do something like wear a mask um, or fill out our questionnaire you know, on your, your self-assessment as to your physical condition. Um, but I think it's very reasonable for us to ask them to do that. Um, something else that MSHA did emphasize in its, its um, recent stakeholder call is that they, they do want to work with the mine industry on, um, on being forthcoming about um, information on possible exposures, both to the inspectors and to you know, the places that they, where they've recently been. So um, I think that's a real positive and that's something the industry has been asking for from the, from the beginning. So you know, we're sort of, we're all in this together. And if, if there is an instance where we know we had somebody in the workplace the inspector might have interacted with who is now tested positive for COVID, um, we want to let that inspector know that so he can take precautions. And, you know, we want it to flow the other way. If, if an inspector turns out to be positive, um, I think, you know, it's very reasonable for every mine that he's been to in, you know, such and such a period of time, be notified of that. So they can also let their employees know. 
Right. It's been a few months. I think we've learned, it's taken a while to learn certain things, social distancing and masks and just how to operate. But I think we're to the point now where everyone should have an understanding when it comes to MSHA and the industry. Um, those understandings should probably flow both ways easily without, without any issues. But I suppose there's always going to be some issues. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and if I could just mention one other thing, I think as time is on, we're also learning um, more about what MSHA is going to be doing in terms of inspecting for COVID related hazards. And um, one of the things that we're starting to see is some interest by MSHA in uh, seeing workplace exams that are covering, um, you know, any, any kind of particular um, issues that the virus may be creating in the, in the environment. So, you know, looking to see whether people are um, protected the way that they need to be in terms of having the proper masks available and, and, uh, and things like that. Um, so I, I think workplace exams is one thing I'm just starting to look at, which I think is sort of curious. I wasn't necessarily um, expecting to see that in the virus um, enforcement arena, but I, I think it may be. Um, they're also looking at whether training is being done, maybe site-specific training that needs to be adjusted to talk about what, what our virus protections are. And I'm not saying any things, these things are properly required by the regulations, but this is what, what we're seeing MSHA might be looking at. Um, and the agency is also looking at illness reporting and whether we are properly um, reporting um, what, what, what are known to have been workplace, um, you know, workplace um, COVID transmissions, if you will, where people become sick because they got it at the mine. Um, fortunately, there have been very few incidents of that that anybody's aware of, but, um, but MSHA is expecting that to be reported. Um, so, you know, they're, they're just there. I think over time we might see that MSHA is actually going to start applying some of their regulations um, uh, against protection um, for COVID. So that'll be something to keep an eye out on and make sure that we feel that that's proper. So that may be coming, but it's not necessarily being enforced at this moment, you're saying, Margo? I think it is being enforced to some extent, but I haven't heard of a lot of incidents where there was any concern with it. And by enforced, I mean, I think, I think they're starting to look for it. I haven't seen uh, citations coming out of it yet, but I'm concerned that may be coming. Okay. Thank you to Vandergraaff for sponsoring this month's edition of Road to Recovery. Visit their website for more information about the Vandergraaff drum motor designed specifically for heavy industry applications.